Did you know? School Sport Victoria offers 650,000 sporting opportunities in 31 different sports. At 10,700 events across the state every single year. That's a lot of kids playing sport. And for over 25 years, the Victorian School Sports Awards have recognised more than 1,500 students, teachers and volunteers for excellence and outstanding contribution to school sport. Now that's a champion effort. Good afternoon and welcome to the Ask SSV show. We've got the very lovely Jemima Montag with us, Olympian race walker. Welcome, Jemima. Thanks, Raph. Thanks for having me. No problem. Our pleasure indeed. We're pretty excited to have you on board, but there's other people that are more excited. We've got for the first time seven students that want to join and ask you questions live. And I think that's a testament to your character. Everyone that I've talked to says she's just such a nice person. So obviously they want to get on and ask you loads of questions. We want to talk just a little bit about your achievements at the moment. You've got so many international achievements. 2014 Oceana Race Walk Championships in Hobart. 2014 World Race Walking Cup in China. 2018 Oceana Race Walking Championships in Adelaide. Again in 2018, the big Com Games, Gold Coast. 2019 University Games in Naples and 2019 Qatar World Championships and again 2019 Australian Walk Championships in Melbourne. Now, what people may not realise is that your first international appearance, you got a gold in 2014, but then you got a bronze in 2014 again a silver in 2018, a gold at the Com Games, another gold at the University Games, a silver, a, sorry, a silver at the University Games, a gold at, um, in Townsville, and another silver. So that's, that's a haul of medals that are international medals. That's massive. <laughs> Thank you. How, how, does it, how did you go competing in an international championship at such a young age, which we'll get into in a second, but your first international championship and coming home with a gold. So, I which one are we referring to? So you, the Oceana Race Walking Championships in Hobart in 2014. Oh. That was your first, like it was in Hobart, but it was an it was an international meet. So how did you go with that? I guess it was, in, yeah, it was it was more of a national championship that one. But so that was in the February. Um, I was just turned 16 and I knew that I needed to get a time on the board if I wanted to put on the green and gold for the first time and go to the World Race Walking Cup later that year and I'd spent the summer training with um, uh, some Brisbane race walkers down at Runaway uh, Rainbow Day and yeah I was feeling fit and excited and confident and it was a beautiful course along sort of the dock in Hobart where all the boats come in near Salamanca markets and it was a warm morning, but we prepared for it all summer in that training camp. And it was it was an exciting race to secure that first green and gold t-shirt. Which is so exciting. And it would have been so exciting to just wear the green and gold for the first time. But when you went and competed, and I think it was at the, um, before the Commonwealth Games, the Oceana Race Walking Championships in Adelaide, or maybe even in China, you you only competed in the 20k race twice before that is that correct yeah correct so the commonwealth games race was my third race amazing, amazing. Was, i'd done so in 2017 in december so that was the oceania race to refer to with my first i did another at the adelaide com games trial in the february which is the oceana race you refer to and then the third was the commonwealth games of course we do 20k walks in training more frequently but in terms of racing the distance it's of course much faster and it's different so yeah i was only a fresh a fresh one when it pretty that's pretty amazing stuff when when people listening probably didn't know that and we've got some images behind you of you doing some race walking which will come up in a minute and you cooking and reading books and all the stuff that you do but pretty amazing that that was the third race and you were in front of a home games we've got some special guests that we're going to get to in a second um but Tell me, how did school sport 
fair and sort of shape you into the elite athlete that you have now become? That's a great question. So I went to Wesley College right through from prep and I was always really encouraged to just try a whole range of sports. And I think that's the real, that's the message I want to get across to everyone today is that the best thing you can do is throw yourself into all kinds of things, make the focus enjoyment, making friends and having fun in the process while you're young. And yeah, I think the key lessons I learned were really about how to train as an elite athlete through my time at Wesley, um, how to be part of a team and how exciting it can be to play sport at that higher level. We had Tim O'Shaughnessy leading our athletics and cross country teams at Wesley. And he would often bring in more elite or older athletes that he had some connection to and, and bring them in to speak to us on particular, say, acts camp. And I really found that exciting. I remember the first time he brought in Benita Willis, uh, the amazing cross country runner, and just holding that gold medal that she had from the World Cross Country Championships was a real moment for me as a high school kid, thinking, this is real, this is tangible, and maybe this could be me. So wow. that, was, that was a great experience, really. It would have been, and, and, and at such a young age to start competing at international events as well is it's pretty amazing, but that, that it's, it's so interesting that you can recall the moment you held the gold medal and that became a real driver for you. We've got Ethan Nash, who's joining us from Lorimer Primary School. He's got some great questions he wants to ask you. Ethan, how are you, buddy? Good. That's good. Sorry about the camera, just the angle there. It's uh, making you look a little bit oblong, but we can work with that. Now, you like walking, right? Yeah. What's your favorite part about the walks? Uh, I just like doing it for fun, you know? That's so really good. Do. Now, you, you got a question for Jemima. Uh, yeah. Um, when did you start, when did you first start race walking and why? Great question, thanks Ethan. I started race walking when I was seven years old. I joined Brighton Little Athletics Club, which was my local one. And I guess in Little Axe, you just give everything a go. And I was good at race walking and good at sort of the 800, 1500 and pretty shocking at everything else. So <laughs> I guess initially it was just fun to be good at something. <laughs> yeah, kind of the same mm -hmm. for me. How did you get started, Ethan? How did you get started in race walks? Um, what what made guess... you pick up race walks? Um, I just saw my sister doing it and I got really inspired and started going to where she trained and and then like when I got to like under nines I found out that I was really good at it and I really enjoyed it. You certainly are. I, I personally have seen you do your race walking thing at competitions and win state championships and pretty amazing young man so lots of I, th I think the future is pretty bright for you. And speaking about your sister, I think she's going to join us in a second. So we'll come back to you once um, Maddie is ready to go. And just coming back to some of those questions, um, where, when you said it started at such a young age, was there an inspiration besides the gold medal? Was there someone who drove you and, and wanted you to do it? Not really. I guess... Mum was a 400 hurdler, so she signed my sisters and us up for little athletics thinking perhaps we'd enjoy it, given that she did. But I was always a generalist, you know, I did a decade of ballet, I played basketball, soccer, life-saving swimming, shapes and musical instruments to go. It was really a matter of trying a whole range of things. And then, you know, race walking is a peculiar sport. It's not like the other events or, you know, bigger sports in Australia, for example, footy or netball, where you might have a role model in mind as a young kid. I just sort of fell into it in little athletics and I thought um, there's a real opportunity here where given that I've got this raw talent, um, I could put on that green and gold one day and that was enough to sort of excite me and keep me going. Which is so good. Now, you, you mentioned before you did ballet, you played other sports as well. What caused you to drop all those other sports because i'd imagine in every sport that you played you would have been really good at so what caused you to just drop them and go i need to focus on race walking <laughs> that's a great question because i'm actually terrible at quitting things <laughs> <laughs> i found it really hard but i honestly think one of the best things i did um was to not specialize too early honestly right through school up until i was about 18 
I race walked maybe two or three times a week um, mm. and the rest was really filled with music and study and other sports. And I'm really grateful that my junior coach, Simon Baker, was really, uh, really fostered that great junior environment where, you know, he introduced me to great training rituals and patterning throughout the week, but it was, you know, nothing too much. And there was great balance and I was able to have sort of a, a nice rounded childhood experience. And then when I was ready and sort of developed and eager to go at 18, it was then sort of everything else peeled off and walking's gonna be the focus. Brilliant. Now we've got Maddie Nash who's joining us from Hazel Glen College. Maddie Nash, as Hi. we just heard, uh, is the inspiration between uh, for um, Ethan Nash to get into walking. How are you, Maddie? I'm okay. <laughs> and you love race walking as well? Yes. What's your favourite distance in terms of race walking? Um, I think I like, the th I like the 3K because it's not too much race walking, but it's also not like really short distance. It's like an even distance, so... How mind blowing is it that Jemima Montag does twenty kilometers? Oh, no, <laughs> I struggle just to do like five k half the time. I don't know how she does twenty. Oh, I struggle to drive twenty kilometers. Now, what's your question for Jemima? Um, my question for you is: What has been your hardest race, and why? Wow, what a great question! It is a great question. Okay, I have a follow up question for you before. <laughs> <laughs> hardest in terms of a physical challenge or hardest in terms of sort of my headspace and motivation? Well, yeah, like motivation and mental sort of side. Okay, yeah, cool. The hardest race <laughs> was at the beginning of year 12. So it was our February nationals in Adelaide and it was to qualify for World Juniors and what happened was there were three spots on the world junior team, but there were four of us, four girls in the sort of under 18 age group that all really wanted the three spots. And unfortunately, when that happens, four has to fit into three and one, one person misses out. And I'd sort of let that really get to me. And whenever the four of us had been on youth development camps or training camps in the lead up to that race, I was really intimidated by the other three. and talking myself down and my self-belief really wasn't there so by the time we got to race day I'd also just started year 12 I was completely nervous and didn't believe in myself it made sort of from the first step the race was really difficult it was 10k and I knew within you know how you just have that feeling within the first hundred meters that this is going to be tough and it was hard to finish, to be honest, but I really didn't want to pull out and give up. It just wasn't my day. I wasn't in the correct mindset. And I ended up being the fourth Australian. So the other three girls got to go to World Juniors. I missed out. And I think it was a real challenge and a real turning point that forced me to really address that self-doubt. And I started sort of working with a sports psych from then on. And that's been a really great step for the rest of my career. Cool. What a great answer. Now, can I just follow up to while Maddie's here? What because negative thinking is is so pertinent to many people. Apparently, we have 70,000 negative thoughts a day, which is huge. You don't need to go into in depth and detail, but what are one or two things that you have put in place to to block that negative thinking? So the first great realization was that it's much more helpful to focus on what we can control. So often in hard races like that, the negative thoughts are to do with how hot it feels and you know the weather's out of our control. Or we're thinking about the other girls in the race and how fast and easy it seems for them. And that's also out of our control. So what I learned at that time was that it's much more helpful during the race to direct your thoughts to things that are in your control, such as your breathing or your technique or what sort of the voice in your mind is saying or looking out at the nice surroundings and really taking your mind off, say, the weather or how many kilometres there are to go or the other competitors. Um, and the second thing that's really helped that my sports psychologist taught me is that whenever one of those sayings from the inner critic in your mind pipes up, it's about not freaking out that you've got a negative thought, 
being aware of it and then being curious as to what it means and actually having some things up your sleeve to sort of shut it down. Because it's okay to have the negative thought and it's totally normal. But if you can have some little three word phrases up your sleeve that sort of, you know, smack that negative voice away, then it, it can be really great. So for each race, I sort of think up some different phrases with my psych. But for example, if I'm starting to feel really hot, for example, at the World Champs in Doha, that might be a negative thought. You know, my head feels like it's going to explode or my feet are on fire. I then have a countermeasure to tell myself, which might be, okay, visualize the ice vest, visualize like you're walking on, you know, cold, wet grass. Think about all the heat preparation that you've done. This may be uncomfortable, but you can get through it because you've done the preparation. So it's about sort of flipping it from an unhelpful thought to a helpful thought. What an amazing answer, Maddie. What a great tip for you as you continue to grow into your sport. Thanks for joining us, Maddie. You're great, and we look forward to seeing you at another show soon. Thank you. What a great answer. Now, I mean, you did talk a little bit about the heat and all of that. That that takes the Commonwealth Games gold medal to a completely new level in my mind because, I mean, I remember watching it on the screen, but I don't know if you remember, or you probably do, a couple of days earlier, the male, whose name escapes me, who completely collapsed out of heat exhaustion, did did that impact you going into the race? Did did that was that playing on your mind? You're speaking about the marathon runner here. Sorry, the marathon runner. Yes. Yeah. Um, I was definitely nervous when we entered the pre-camp, and it was quite a bit warmer in that Gold Coast Brisbane area than it had been in Melbourne. And I realised, oh my goodness, we've actually sort of forgotten to do any heat preparation. And it was only sort of a week to go, so there was really no time to do any heat preparation. And I think I was on the phone to mum saying, oh my goodness, I've just done, you know, an easy 12k walk in Brisbane and it felt really hot and I'm so sweaty and I just don't know whether we've prepared enough for this Gold Coast heat. Um, but luckily I was in very safe hands with my coach who's coached many elite athletes to Com Games and Olympic level before. In fact, he competed at his own Com Games in 98 and he had the ice vest and the um, digestion and the towels and all of the pre-cooling scientific side of things sorted and we did a really I guess aggressive pre-cool before the start line which got my core temperature nice and low and so then even if your core temperature does do its normal sort of escalation throughout the race at least it started at a nice low point and it doesn't get to that sort of dangerous point where you're feeling a bit dizzy and like you may yeah faint <laughs> like the, the poor guy in the marathon. Brilliant. Now, thanks for that. Now, we've got Catherine who's joined us from Middle Park Primary School. How are you, Catherine? Good, thanks. That's How good. <laughs> I, I'm good, thank you. Thanks for asking. I think Jemima's good too. What's your question for Jemima? What food do you eat before you train and compete? Great question, Catherine. Thank you. So, it took me a while to figure out what would be the most comfortable to eat. We all know that that feeling where you've sort of had the wrong thing and you try and train and it just feels like everything is slushing around and it's no fun. But when I started working closely with a sports dietitian, she taught me a lot. And I think the most important thing, if it's before training or before a competition, is that it's got to be simple but simple things that are quite low in fibre that um, your gut is going to be happy with. So my go-to is toast with honey, banana and cinnamon. And I find that the energy <laughs> from the toast and the honey and the banana, actually, cinnamon's just the fun, because I'm a bit obsessed with cinnamon. Um, that combo always makes me feel energized, but it also feels quite light and sits well and doesn't lead to any coming upset. And then, you know, once training or the race is over, you can have the ice cream and whatever feels good. <laughs> yeah, with the banana, I love having bananas before I am. Um and yeah. and when I have porridge for breakfast, I love cinnamon on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> We're twins. That's great. <laughs> now you got another question for Jemima, Catherine? Yes. How? What was your dream when you were little? Oh, that's a nice question. Was that was that the whole question? 
yeah what was your dream when you were little in in terms of sport and you know that sort of thing and and even package it into what challenges have you faced as well great question well i think honestly as soon as i started little athletics when i was seven people would be talking about one day becoming olympians and that was definitely a dream that i had from that point but i think when we were talking about it in little athletics we sort of said it, but none of us truly believed it would ever happen, nor did we understand how difficult it would be to sort of get to that Olympian stage. It always seemed like this far off um, idea really in my head, but it was nice because it provided some sense of working towards a goal and a sense of purpose. Um, but of course, <laughs> it wasn't easy and there have been challenges along the way. Um, there are some years during high school where I didn't feel so motivated with sport and I sort of had a break from it for a year or so and then had to find my way back and change coaches and um, start working with more sort of professionals in the sporting area like dietitians and psychologists to really help me get to that more elite level where you can then represent Australia at the Olympics. So I think it's about having that initial goal and then whenever there's a challenge or you fall short or get injured or miss out on a team, it's about trying to learn something from all of the little falls rather than sort of feeling sorry for yourself and quitting. And as long as you've learned something, then it wasn't a mistake. It was just a great learning opportunity. And each time you come back stronger and closer to that dream. What a great answer, hey, Catherine. She's a wealth of knowledge, this young lady. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks for joining us, Catherine. We'll, I'm sure we'll see you back for some, for some future shows. Thanks for having me. No Bye. worries. Bye. What great questions, uh, answers you are giving, Jemima. Yeah, seriously, you've got some, gra I've got some questions here as well, but I'm, I'm getting out of the way because these students are just rolling in and I've got some more, the two more that are ready to join us as well. Um, Lachlan will be joining us in just a second, but just going back just briefly what how do you combat the thought or what do you say to people that sometimes say you know walking's not really a sport kind of thing like surfing's not really a sport you must have heard that before and it is a silly in my opinion it's a silly opinion mm -hmm. but how do you combat that what do you say to them yeah that's a great question Raph I mean any time that I'm race walking in public, which is <laughs> daily, uh, you get a whole host of stares and sometimes, as you say, people will make a comment. So often people are looking at me and they're either smiling, angry, confused or concerned <laughs> because they're at me and they think, oh, that mustn't be good for you. Um, and there was sort of a troll on social media the other day, so this is quite a good example, who said, um, really, walking? like." Mm, you could do better than that or why have you sort of pitched yourself there or um, is it really a sport and I think I mean there are uh, there are multiple ways to address this if we think about what constitutes a sport I mean it's something <laughs> with rules that um, may or may not be part of a team and is quite a physical exertion and I mean <laughs> I'd probably ask that person who doesn't think it's a sport to try it and race me and uh, they'd see how puffed and sore they'd get because it's it's really hard. I think it's harder than running, to be honest. I do both of them. And it's really quite a physical challenge. There are many rules. There are judges standing there watching us. And I mean, yeah, it's definitely a sport. Um, and in terms of caring or not what others think of it as a sport, I think what I've learned over the years is we're all just here in this world to sort of find a sense of belonging somewhere, find our own meaning in life. And if you're lucky enough to find it in a sport, in a career, in an art form, in whatever, then, you know, you've already won and it really doesn't matter. There are billions of people on this planet, the opinion of one other person, um, as long as you're enjoying what you're doing and not harming others, I think we should be able to do whatever makes us happy. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. What a great answer. And, and I hadn't thought about the fact that you you would be like if anyone's in Melbourne they know we're only allowed to um, be out there training an hour a week and all that but an hour a day sorry but when you are out the technique you use would draw some attention 
Yeah. Well, on one hand, it's quite helpful because people don't even, people know who I am straight away. They don't even hesitate if it's sort of a friend or family member. They're like, oh, hey, Jen, because it's so recognizable. <laughs> but uh, it certainly draws the eye. And, um, yeah. you know, that's great. <laughs> people can have some entertainment, whatever. I'm sorry to hear about the troll too, and, and we can talk about that offline. If it was someone to do with this show, then we will oh. certainly follow that one up. But Never that, random. you know, that <laughs> obviously that social media stuff, you you seem like a, you, I know you're a very bright girl and very academic as well, as well as an elite sports person, but you seem like you've got your head screwed on well. Hey, we've got another special guest who's joined us. This young man is Lachlan. Lachlan, you're from Hazel Glen College. How are you, buddy? Good, how are you? Good, thank you. Oh, look at that. He's wearing his region championship shirt. Isn't that good? Now, tell me, Lachlan, what do you um, know about Jemima or what you know about race walking? Uh, well, Jemima came to our school for an uh, interview for the ADA. Right. And she spoke to us there as well. Great. Fantastic. What's your question for Jemima? Uh, how do you prepare yourself mentally for a race? That's a great question, Lachlan. I really think that the mental preparation side of it is almost more important or just as important as the physical training that we do, especially in the week or two before a race where all the hard work on the track's really done and it's time to just get in that in the zone, as we call it as athletes. I think what has worked for me is re-watching footage from races that have gone well or looking at sort of images of races that have gone well and using the power of vis visualization to sort of imagine yourself feeling like you did that day, feeling strong and fit and happy and enjoying the race. I think there's something really to be said for visualization. In fact, when I was your age, mum and I used to do this thing before, say, regionals or state or national championships where I'd look in the mirror and I'd do the race walking action on the spot so just with my arms and we'd sort of talk through the race and so if it was a 3k we'd just be there for 15 minutes visualizing and imagining being there and we'd talk through how the weather would feel and what the other competitors would be doing and how my body would be feeling and the different focus for the first second and third kilometers and I really think that you make these synaptic connections when you practice visualization and then you find that when the gun actually goes on the day your body just sort of knows what to do and you've prepared it's sort of about it's about optimism and expecting a good result and because you've done all the physical training in the lead in to this extra little mental training um i think that'll set you up for a the best result possible Pretty full answer there, Lachlan. What do you think? You reckon you can put some of that into practice? Like, do you um, do you play sport yourself? Yeah. What sport do you play? I play football. Nice. And do you ever watch vision of yourself playing and 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 do the visualization thing? Uh, no. You will now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, thanks for joining us, buddy. Good luck with your schooling and your sport as well and and we we love hazel glen hazel glen's a great college like Lorimer and, and diamond valley who's joining us next but thanks for joining us and we will be in touch i'm sure and see you in some future shows thanks thanks lucky what a great young man we've got so many that are coming on to the show right now which is fantastic um we um what sacrifices have you had to make to because you talked about just before you, you mentioned you know when you were young you thought about getting to the olympics but you didn't know how much hard work was going to be involved because as you probably would have found especially um doing ballet your core strength would have been phenomenal so at a young age doing ballet and getting some good core strength meant you could compete in sport at a young age and you didn't really need to train it was just a natural talent but then the natural talent would have been would have waned off and you would have had to com you know commit to strength and conditioning um all of that so tell me in regard to your um reaching the olympics what sacrifice have you had to make to get there that's a great question and i think whilst when you were sort of asking it 
my mind was thinking, oh, well, they don't really feel like sacrifices because this is what I'm choosing to do and really most of what's involved in the preparation feels like a great challenge and something that I'd like to be doing. But at the same time, of course, <laughs> there are things that um, are challenging about it and things that we have to say no to as part of the process. So I think you're spot on. I sort of got away with it as a junior. You know, you're growing and you've got that natural talent and you can sort of turn up every Saturday and you almost get a personal best week week just because you've grown another inch and you never really have to um, make those sacrifices or put in too much work. But as you say, you hit that plateau eventually. It's got to be somewhere. And that's really hard to deal with mentally because you think, oh, it's not so fun going backwards or sort of staying the same. But then if you're able to apply that positive mindset of, okay, this is normal, this is where I'm at, what expert can I bring in in my areas of weakness to create a support network and elevate my outcome overall? So I think once I created that support network, I was able to, I guess, better understand what the life of an elite athlete looks like. And the biggest thing I've had to adjust or sacrifice, I guess, is how much I try and cram into the day. I'm sort of one of those personalities who was always go, 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 as you can probably tell in terms of all my hobbies and co-curricular things, um, going from one thing to the other without really taking a breath. But something I've really had to work on, and I think if anything, if there's been a silver lining from this pandemic, it's been a forced lesson in how to do less and actually pay attention to recovering from sessions and having some downtime and sort of um, you know, plugging in to my training diary, all of the stats, rather than seeing the training session as simply a, a dot on the to-do list to cross off. Um, so that means, I guess, sacrificing a little bit of social time if, if friends want to be out partying late at night or, um, you know, not fueling their bodies the way I need to or perhaps with alcohol and, and other things, then that may be a sacrifice. But I always think that a bit of a balance is really healthy for the mind and um, perhaps in periods throughout the year where we're having a bit of a rest, maybe after the Olympics or after the World Champs, um, it's nice to step away and allow yourself to indulge in those things that you may have gone without for a while. What a great answer. And I, I love your answer because you aren't seeing it as sacrifices, but just choices you're making. Because let's, you know, I don't want to put pressure on you, but let's face it, you're only 22. So you're very young. You've got a number of Olympics and Com games left in you, like as long as the body holds up and all that. But you're in great form. You're in great shape. So these choices you're making, you'll continue to make for a little bit longer. We've got Amelia who's joined us as well. Amelia's from Diamond Valley College, if I remember correctly. Yes, she is. And Amelia's got some great questions. G'day, Amelia. How are you? Hello. I'm good, thanks. That's good. Now, do you play sport yourself? Uh, yes, I do. What do you play? Um, I play netball and I do athletics and dancing. Nice. What's your favourite discipline in athletics? Um, I don't really know. <laughs> Just like them all? Yeah, but especially Good. the race walking. But I do enjoy doing all events. Good on you. So you, so you um, do like the race walking part? Yes. Excellent. Well, that's you've got the great person to ask your question to. What's your question to Jemima? Um, I want to know how you manage your time between training and uni work and personal commitments. Great, great question. question. Yeah, that's a popular question as well. Um, I like to think of it in terms of an analogy. I, I think analogies always make these sort of answers a bit more helpful. So do you play uh, a musical instrument or do you listen to, do you like music in general? Uh, yeah, I do play a musical instrument. Okay, great. Wow. That'll make this easier. So yeah. you can imagine my analogy like a music score with all of the different um, stars with the different lines for the instruments and the, the conductor is looking at the music score and we're the conductor of our own life. And yeah. For the overall sound of the orchestra or the band to sound nice, um, we can't have all of the instruments playing, you know, loud chorus all at the same time. 
while say the string section, a soloing, then the rhythm and accompaniment might come down and it's only for a little bit. And then once the strings are finished, we might have another section from the rhythm and the, um, and the brass, for example. And so there's this nice ebb and flow in the music to create harmony in the overall sound. And that's how you can imagine the way to balance, um, for example, training and uni work and cooking for my family and spending time with friends. These are all things that I love doing. And I think it's important to know that we can have it all. We can juggle many things, but we just can't have it all at once. So it's about prioritizing and understanding that throughout the year there will be different months or points where your different hobbies are of differing importance. So when a nationals or a state or regional championship is coming up, I might say to my coach, okay, this is going up high volume on the music score and yeah. I might have to, you know, say no to some social commitments or tell my family I can't really cook every night or um, dial back the study a little bit. And sometimes that feels uncomfortable to sort of sacrifice or say no to things. But I think what we've got to remember is that when we say yes to something, we're actually saying no to something else. And we don't want to be saying no to that thing that's of high priority because state or nationals are coming up. And yeah. you can sort of find comfort at that moment knowing that everything, you know, time moves on. And as soon as state championships are done, they'll come down on the volume and down on the music score. And what can replace it is more study, more time with friends, more time for those other hobbies. And you just create this really nice ebb and flow throughout the year where you can yeah. balance everything. It's just that at different points, different things will have more of your energy and time. Oh, wow. <laughs> what an amazing answer. I was just thinking we could probably take that answer and do a whole hour just on that. Yeah. <laughs> That's definitely the question I get the most. So I've perfected the analogy, but... um. Yeah, we could we could chat more another time. <laughs> yeah. Now, Amelia, you play netball, you do dancing, you do athletics, and you play a musical instrument. They're the only things you've yeah. mentioned. You've probably got others. How on earth do you fit in school and everything else? Because you sound very busy. <laughs> well, the musical instrument is at school, so I already okay. you know just practice that on and off for only about fifteen minutes, and then the like all my trainings and all that kind of stuff, they're all on separate days as well. So they never clash and all that kind of stuff. Brilliant. Well, thanks for joining us. I'm certain Thank we're you. not going to see the last of you. I think we're going to see you in the green and gold without putting pressure on you in the future. <laughs> Good luck in the future with all your sport and your musical instrument. And we'll put um, Jemima's, hash, uh, Jemima's Instagram account in the show notes if you want to ask her questions later on. Okay. <laughs> thanks for joining us. Thank you. What a mature young lady she is. We've got a couple more coming up. Um, I, I'm full disclosure here, Jemima. I've, I've heard lots about you and we've interacted a little bit when I had you down at Meadow Glen when we had the athletics meet and we got rained out that day. I don't know if you remember that or not, but that was a crazy day. And I've heard lots about you, but I had no idea on the depth of your knowledge of certain things. Like I, I'm not just saying this and, I, and you can listen to the shows because I don't say it every show, but your answers are phenomenal to be quite frank you're not just giving surface answers you're giving very well thought out very calculated um, answers to questions and deep answers to questions that kids can take away and really um, first you know, think about because you know your comment just before that um, we we allow certain priorities to take priority at a certain season and then they we scale back and by saying yes to something you're saying no to something else that is gold in itself so <laughs> you're a, you're a wealth of knowledge and we've got another young man who's joining us right now i think we've got max davidson and max davidson is from lorimer primary school max let me see let me get him on max how are you buddy that's good. We can't hear you right now. Like, just speak for me again. Just, have you got a question? Yeah, just check your microphones on. We'll come back to you. In you got you good? Me now. Yep, can hear you perfectly. Good work. Now, do you play sport, Max? Ah, uh, yes, I do. I knew that was going to be the answer because you look like a sporty little guy. What sports do you play? Uh, I play. Obviously, I do athletics. I do footy. And awesome. I 
dancing, footy, and athletics. Now, out of athletics, which is your favorite discipline? Uh, the walk. Definitely. Really? Good work. You got, you're loving this, aren't you, Jemima? <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. What's your favorite distance? Uh, probably the 1100. Is that because that's the maximum you can go? You can't go any further than 1100? Yeah. <laughs> so when you get to 3K, you'll be happy with that one, right? Maybe. <laughs> now, what's your question for Jemima? Um, my question is, what are the tips for walkers to increase their speed and endurance? Wow, great question, Max. Um, how do I walk in speed and endurance? Okay, so in terms of speed, I think what's really important is to work on your technique. Um, because if you just think about physics, I know you might not have learned this in school yet, but velocity or speed is all about how long your stride is and how quickly you're stepping over your, your turnover. So if you can have a nice long stride and a nice quick turnover, that'll make you go faster. And I think a really nice tip that I remember from Little Athletics is that sometimes when your legs are feeling tired and like they can't turn over any quicker, what you can actually yeah. do is just pump your arms faster and your legs will follow. Because often our arms, you know, don't feel so tired. So that's one thing to do, work on technique and think about pumping yep. your arms as fast as you can for speed. And then in terms of endurance, um, I think at your age, making sure once a week, there's a bit of a longer walk. I used to do mine on a Sunday. So we, we would do one lap of Gels Park, which I think was a little less than nine kilometers, about eight kilometers to start yep. working our endurance. And another thing that helps with endurance is doing sort of, um, you know, 400 meter reps with a little bit of a break in between and just learning how to cope with that fatigue and that lactic that we can feel after each rep. And, yep. you know, rejigging, getting your breath back, having a sip of water and going again. So yep. I think, yeah, if you can start laying those foundations of having one longer walk in the week, some speedy reps where you're doing quite a few of them and learning to keep going when you feel tired. And the most important with walking at your age, really, is to start making your technique as perfect as possible. And that will help yeah. you go fast and not be disqualified by the judges. <laughs> what a great answer. Now, we've just had Amelia, your sister on the show now, tell us, mate, while yeah. she's not here, who's, who's faster, you or Amelia in the race walks? Probably Millie. <laughs> Probably because she's taller. That's fantastic. Hey, good luck with your sport, mate, with your, with your dancing, with your football, and with your race walking. We look forward to seeing your name in lights in the future, buddy. Thank you. No Thanks. worries. Thanks for joining the show. We'll see you in the future, I'm sure. Yep, see ya. Now, we've got one more uh, person coming on in just a second, but um, what? when the Olympics were cancelled and the announcement was made, how did you go with that announcement? What sort of went through your mind and how did you cope with that announcement? So I answered this question in three parts. Um, I explained to people how I, what my initial reaction was, how I adapted and how I reshaped later on. So my initial reaction to the postponement of the games was definitely a bit destabilized and lost. You know, it's been really my focus for quite a few years now. It was all I was thinking about during the countdown at New Year's Eve and it was really going to shape 2020. So when it was no longer happening, I just thought, what do I do with myself now? And training felt a bit meaningless, but not training didn't feel good either. And it sort of felt like time was moving forward, but with a sense of stagnancy because I didn't have that carrot dangling, that goal to run towards anymore. I then, I'd allowed myself, you know, a couple of weeks to sit with that feeling of sadness and discomfort. But then, of course, it was time to adapt and reshape. So I spoke to my coach, Brent, about going into more of a base general prep training phase um, because I didn't feel as though it was sustainable to continue to train, you know, sort of full on for an entire year. But we changed it up. We decided that rather than viewing this as a, a sad, gloomy <laughs> sort of situation, we could flip the thinking to a helpful one where it was simply a shift of timelines that would give us a bonus 12 months as opposed to a upsetting 12 months where we could finally do things that we may never have had time to do before or never have had the freedom of an extra 12 months. 
So we, uh, at the earlier point in lockdown where you could drive outside your 5K, we were incorporating hill training in the Dandenongs. We were trying, you know, stronger lifts in the gym and all these little things that as athletes, we often say we're too busy to do. And then when it came to reshaping after adapting and reacting, reshaping was really about how, what other focuses can I have this year that um, aren't necessarily about putting on the green and gold and traveling for races because those things aren't happening. So I've really been able to reshape my why factor in sport um, from something that was great, but really before it was only about competing and representing Australia and sort of challenging myself. Now it's about inspiring the next generation, going and speaking at schools and seeing how I can sort of use my platform as an elite athlete for good. Um, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to have reshaped the year and reshaped my why factor because I think it's much more meaningful now and how lucky that we've sort of had this bonus amount of time to, to really get to that Tokyo 2021 start line in as, as good form as possible. Brilliant. And, and another very full answer that I had a hundred questions come to my mind that I, I won't get to because we are running out of time, but we've got um, Emily who's joining us in a moment. But need to say this at this point, congratulations on your selection. For those who don't know, the IAAF or World Athletics has um, given permission for those who were pre-selected for Tokyo 2020 to now move forward to Tokyo 21. So that is a massive feather in your cap and you must be super excited about that. Yeah, it was a big relief when they announced it last week and uh, oh, it just feels like a very rare opportunity <laughs> for 12 months out that you're in and I really want to make the most of it and sort of do all the work now to get myself in the best shape possible for 12 months time. It really is a, a prize seat that you're in in a sense that you now don't have to pressure yourself about being selected you're selected so you can now focus on all the strength and conditioning the the toning up the fitness and all of that stuff that's really important to get you to um be as fit as possible or as fast as possible during that time that's so good 100 percent. because in a normal season you know we're having all of these mini Correct. trips and traveling around the world trying to chase qualifying time so it feels like a unique spot and I try and make the most of it. That's so good. And there are a number of athletes that were selected and we congratulate them all. Like I said, we've got Emily who's joined us now. Emily is from Kilbreda College. How are you, Emily? Good, thank you. That's good. Now, do you do, you do race walking or do you play sport? Yep, I play race. I do race walking. I also do athletics and dance. Nice. We've had a few dancers on here today, haven't we? So you like race walking. What's your favourite distance in race walking? Um, I like the distance races. I think they're really fun. So the, I think probably my favourite at the moment is 10K, but I've only done it once. It's so nice. Wow. So you like the distance ones because they're fun. I wouldn't have thought distance and fun would have gone in the same sentence there, but that's nice. brilliant. What's your question for Jemima? My question is, has your training and preparation for the Olympics changed in the current pandemic? Great question. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> it's definitely changed. Um, so I was just explaining to Raph that we had to rejig things earlier in the year. So say from March until about now, the way things changed were more to do with going into more of a base general prep phase with just lower intensities, long kilometers, lots of work in the gym to really build a strong base that we can then jump off when the races come back. Because I think it's a, it's a bit tiring to sort of be doing big, strong uh, speed sessions all year round. And I wanted to have a bit of fun with it, given that the year felt really long. Um, but as you can probably imagine, and I'm sure it's the same for you now under stage four restrictions in Melbourne, things have changed once again. We've got our 5K radius rule and our 60 minutes per day rule. So again, we've had to reshape and adapt the training program. And the one thing that's really saved me is that um, I have a treadmill in the garage. And so I've been able to do sort of the extra kilometers that don't fit into the one hour in the day, um, getting to know that treadmill well. And I think the only thing keeping me sane is sort of having some podcasts ready to go and even if it sort of feels monotonous and boring on the treadmill, 
you can use it as an opportunity to really work on your technique. So I've popped a mirror next to the treadmill and even though I'm on the spot for hours and hours, it's an opportunity to sort of look in that mirror, make sure my techniques are safe and efficient as possible so that when races come back, um, the judges are happy with me. <laughs> That's so good. That's a great answer, don't you think, Emily? Yeah, that's a good answer. That's good. Where do you want to take your race walking one day? Like, what is what are you excited about in the future? Uh, sorry, I couldn't really hear that. Like, do you want to go to the Olympics one day, represent Australia in the Com Games? It would be nice to do that, but I'm currently just trying to work on um, consistently breaking like um, different things I want to do and goals and seeing new ones. Good on you, and that's where it all starts actually. So good on you for not putting pressure on yourself and enjoying it, because enjoyment is really important. Thanks for joining us. We will, um, I'm sure, grab you at another show in the future, but thanks for joining us today. What a great young lady as well from Kilbreda College, which is uh, pretty far away. But look, you talked a little bit about the hour a week, uh, the hour a day, sorry, the hour a day. Is there exemptions for you in terms of wearing a mask or do you have to wear a mask when you're race walking? Because as people would know in Melbourne, when you're walking, you're supposed to wear a mask. When you're running, you don't wear a mask. But you look at your times in a 20K race, you, you are virtually running one hour 31. That's a you know you, you're going at such a quick pace so what what happens there with the whole mask thing yes yeah, so initially i was also a little hesitant to walk outside and i race walk outside and i was doing a lot more treadmill work than normal but then what i noticed in the guidelines and the the rules that they were putting out is that they actually changed the language to exertional exercise doesn't gotcha. require enough and that was then able to encompass you know, people doing burpees or like an outdoor workout didn't have to wear one as well as race walking, running, um, anything where you're sort of really puffing and sweating and it would be difficult to breathe under a mask. So, yeah, not wearing a mask if I'm race walking fast, but of course if I'm strolling, then yeah. Great. What another great answer. You are just such a blessing to have on the show. Now, we've had some comments come in on our Facebook page. Susie Pasquale has said, beautifully articulated and I think that goes for every answer you've given. Samantha Diddy has come in and said great interview celebrating women's sport. We're just celebrating Jemima Montag and we think you're an exceptional young lady um, and we look forward to seeing what the future holds. I haven't got to all my questions but that's cool because we love connecting students with you. So we want to say a huge thank you for coming on the show, Jemima, and we as School Sport Victoria will continue to champion your cause as you go down this journey of sport, and we know there's many years to come where you're going to be representing the green and gold. Thank you. That's very nice. I feel very grateful to be part of this community in Victoria and, and Sport Victoria, and I just hope that I can continue to sort of give back to this community and yeah, we'll see how many young people we can get through doing the same. Nice. Well done. Well done. Well, we'll see you in the future, I'm sure. But um, thanks heaps for joining us and we'll be in touch. <laughs>